This is White Plains Week, the weekly roundup of White Plains, Westchester, and world news. With John Bailey, editor and publisher of the daily internet newspaper, White Plains Citizen Net Reporter, WPCNR.com. Jim Benneroff, editor and publisher of SuburbanStreet.com and WhitePlains.com. And me, Peter Katz, formerly with NBC, ABC News, and stations from Boston to Los Angeles. White Plains Week, what's happening? Who are the newsmakers? What's in store for the future? The views and opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the participants. White Plains Week is presented on Optimum Cable Channel 76, Verizon Fios Channel 45, and on the internet at whiteplainsweek.com, youtube.com, and wpcommunitymedia.org. Now, White Plains Week. Good evening. This is John Bailey, White Plains Week, and I'm joined by the head of the School of Journalism in White Plains, Jim Benneroff, on my left, and the anchor for all seasons, Peter Katz. And, Jim? The headlines. And here are the headlines for White Plains, week of December 7th, 2018. Mayor Alfred Del Vecchio, architect of White Plains growth for 18 years in the 1980s, passes away. Public visitation for the popular mayor is Sunday, 3 to 8 p.m. at the McMahon, Lyon, and Hartnett Funeral Home. Funeral is Monday, 10 a.m. at Our Lady of Sorrows. State figures say economy takes a nosedive in Westchester County, spelling possible more trouble for the county budget. Sales tax dollars soft for fourth consecutive month, slowing growth of windfall sales tax proceeds through October. Meanwhile, White Plains sales tax handle rebounds strongly in October. Westchester County budget provides up to 2% increase in aid for nonprofits. Westchester, uh, the numbers of poor, the troubled, the at-risk youth, the homeless growing approaches 20% of the county population. President George H.W. Bush, the 41st president, is remembered. Climate damage to the planet accelerates. Congressional stalemate, presidential waffling continues. Thank you, Jim. And of course, as Jim alluded to in the headlines, this is a very sad week for White Plains, New York, USA. Mayor Alfred Del Vecchia, at 95, of year, uh, 95 years of age, passed away this week. And he speaks for himself. Jim, what were your impressions? Um, well, I, I thought that Del Vecchio was probably one of the best, if not the best mayor that the city of White Plains ever had. Um, I got along with him very, very well. Uh, I actually started my newspaper when he came into office. And um, for his first three terms, uh, it was a really, a really great relationship, and um, I think he will be sorely missed. He was, he was a remarkable man. Uh, it was, he was, really an incredible executive. Uh, he was not that much of a politician, but he was. Uh, what he was was really an executive. He, he, he certainly was not the cliché politician no, that, that you think of, yeah. because first and foremost, he had the city in mind. I mean, he, you hear politicians all the time saying, you know, I care about you, I'm working for you. Well, Al Del Vecchio, he was genuine. Yes. He really was passionate about the city of White Plains and the people and protecting the neighborhoods and making for a, a better life. And he also was a family man. I mean, the, the, the almost beyond the cliche of a family man. Mm -hmm. 
he was dedicated to his his wife Claire of 73 years to his children they had they had eight children all together uh, more grandchildren you know than you can count on on both hands mm -hmm. um, he he was the epitome you know of of the family man family was so important to him uh, and to a large degree despite some of the controversies which arose and, and that that happens when you're in the mayor's office for 18 years you're going to make some enemies you're going to have fights you're going to to uh, to to have people who would who would like to take you down mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, despite uh, all of that turmoil um, he was was first and foremost a family man then uh, dedicated uh, and considered uh, the workers in City Hall, part of the family, considered really the residents of the city. Well, he as, was as really part of excellent at picking department heads. Um, he and and he had there was tremendous loyalty for him, um, and he really made things work. Some some of his commissioners were fiercely loyal, Jim. I yeah, mean, I mean, uh, you, uh, you, you can see that uh, in. Uh, Ed Steinberg, for example, the planning commissioner, they'd have disagreements, but they would be intellectual disagreements. They, they'd be disagreements, you know, about certain things, and yet they were famous friends together uh, and, and, and were loyal to one another. Uh, now, you have to keep in mind that Del Vecchio was a smart guy, and he was an engineer. Uh, at one time, he was chairman of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Manhattan College. He was a professor of engineering there. So developers were unable to pull the wool over his eyes. He could look at a blueprint, you know, yeah. and, and, and tell you, Jim, you're full of it, because this, 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 <laughs> and this just won't case. work, see? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I mean, he, th this this was a, a a smart guy, and he saw to it that he surrounded himself with very smart technicians, people who knew what they were doing. Uh, our longtime public works commissioner mm -hmm. in in White Plains, Bud Nicoletti, was one of Al's students at mm -hmm. Manhattan College, and he brought him in. and And Nicoletti, well, you know, with uh, how many accolades you know have we given to Nicoletti right. for for all of his work on infrastructure and and, and the, the snow king, the snow king, yeah, yeah that's right. cleaning the, the streets of the city. Right. Um, so the Del Vecchio uh, administrations uh, achieved something. What they did really was to save this city from mm -hmm. decay. I mean, we had an urban renewal program which which was had been underway. There was federal funding. Um, coming in for it, uh, but but it was out. essentially stalled out, right. right? And Del Vecchio managed to turn things around by having this concept of bringing the Galleria right. into town. You put right. something in the heart of town, things will will start to happen. Right. And in, in in indeed, an, they did yeah, start to right. happen. Now we have gone back into the White Plains Week archives, and we have located an interview that White Plains Week did live with um, Alfred Del Vecchio back on July the 20th, 2001, in which he talked about his years as mayor and what it takes to yeah, be a mayor. Now, on, on, on this, this video, yeah. uh, you're going to see a very young-looking John Bailey, and Jim Benneroff is on there, and then the third person doing the show at that time was Alex Philippides, who was with the... Uh, Westchester, Westchester County, County Business, County Business Journal. Journal. Um, now this this runs about five minutes. It, it's probably uh, the most intellectual five minutes you will see. So there's nothing that can prepare you for for being mayor. Um, uh, when I I ran for mayor, uh, I had been rejected by the Democratic Party for my views, and. Uh, I ran really for the wrong reasons. I ran because I was angry mm -hmm. uh, at being dumped uh, from the party. Uh, but in order to um, prepare for, for being mayor, you need on-the-job training. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, Different cities are different, and the job of mayor uh, is different depending upon the city that you're in. Um, in White Plains, we had 
in uh, an urban renewal area uh, that from 1960 until 1976, for a period of 16 years, very little was done, uh, except, when I say very little was done, the land was prepared for developers. Uh, and um, uh, we did, I mean, the people uh, in urban renewal, and there was 60 of them, I mean, this was a city within a city, uh, did an excellent job preparing the ground, preparing the infrastructure for development. Mm -hmm. Did you see the challenge as being, and how did you go about tackling that? Well, the, what happened in the urban uh, renewal area is that developers would come in and they played a little game with us. Uh, mm -hmm. They would become the sponsor of a piece of property and then without investing any of their money, um, they would uh, make a rendering of what they intended to build, try to get signed leases, then go to a bank and try to borrow money without investing any of their own money, and they would borrow enough money to build a building. But they themselves, the developers, were not at risk. When I became mayor, I said to the urban renewal director, who uh, was the urban renewal director for 16 years and did an excellent job, um, Hereafter, a developer has six months to take down the property and begin building. Uh, we're not going to have him delay projects for two, three, four, five, you know, 16 years. What we had in urban renewal were victory gardens. So the, uh, the urban renewal director told me I couldn't do that, and I said, yes, I could. And uh, we had a disagreement, uh, and he... Um, uh, I fired him. He said, told me I could not fire him because he was uh, the urban renewal director working for a federal agency when I reminded him that I appointed the agency without tenure mm -hmm. and I would get rid of him and, you know, bring in people mm -hmm. who would fire him. Uh, he still didn't believe me, so I fired him. We closed the deal with the Galleria. That kind of opened up the floodgates. Then everybody wanted to build an urban renewal. Mm -hmm. Mind you, we had a 16-year hiatus where all we had were victory gardens there. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to take the risk of building in urban mm -hmm. renewal and dealing with the federal government. Remember, for the first time in the history of this country, the federal government, because inner cities were in bad shape, all in the Northeast, okay, uh, the federal government came down through HUD and said, we are going to deal directly with you. Federal government normally doesn't deal with cities. We're going to deal directly with you, and we're going to give you money to rebuild your city. And that's when Dick Hendy and Ed McCallion took advantage of it and outlined 135 acres for renewal. Mm -hmm. I came into the city both as a councilman, and I was asked to run, and as a mayor, I was asked to run for mayor. I decided that maybe I would have to run only one term mm -hmm. in order to do what I thought was right. Uh, I would strive to do what I think you know was right. I would fight for to get done what I thought was right, and maybe people wouldn't like me, wouldn't like what I did. Well, then you know I'd have to look for something else to do. Uh, I mean, I come from a family where if you ever had less than three jobs, you were considered unemployed. <laughs> Today, it, it seems that uh, you have spin doctors, you know, and what can we do? And we've got to get reelected. Everybody is a um, a psychologist, everybody uh, has public relations people. We got more public relations people in the city of White Plains right now than, than Carter had peanuts. That's right. Know? And lots of commentators, too. <laughs> right. Well, I think you got a lot of what made Alfred Del Vecchio a man who got things done. And he, he was 95 when, when he passed mm -hmm. away uh, early Wednesday morning. Um, he, according to a, a family member I spoke with, uh, he was uh, in, in remarkably good spirits. Uh, he had been uh, active. Uh, he was alert. Um, and um, he'll be very, very sorely missed. Uh, also, at the end of the program, we're going to be playing a piece of tape which has never been publicly seen before and you'll want to stay tuned for it. You will see a side of Alfred Del Vecchio that few people really got to see, yes. but, it, but it, it embodied the essence of the man. That, that's a teaser. That's a teaser. Folks. Exactly. Now, 
Uh, on Wednesday, there was a final hearing on the county budget, and let's go to what it looked like. And now, this was at the county office building in the, in the Board of Legislators' uh, chamber. And about 100 people came down to speak. Most were from low-profit, uh, low-profit, non-profit non <laughs> non organizations. They basically thanked the legislature for restoring 1.5 to 2 percent in funding, or adding that funding to uh, well over 100 uh, uh, non-profit organizations. You know, that, 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 it's sort of a typical scenario that, that you see. Uh, someone prepares a, a budget and one of the things that gets cut are the non-profits, right? Mm -hmm. And then the non-profits do some, some quick organization mm -hmm. and they, they do the public hearing, they do right. the lobbying, and then funding gets restored mm -hmm. to the non-profits and everyone goes away yeah. happy. But what really struck me about this hearing was how many persons are affected and need nonprofit organization yeah, services. True. Uh, the head of the nonprofit organizations of Westchester said it's about 200,000 people in the county out of a million um, are in need of services and uh, at poverty level. And we're going to be, it's something we should keep in mind that this hearing put the face on the misery that nonprofit organizations try and help, and uh, well, you know, not not all, not all of us. Uh, Some, uh, you know, do rather interesting things in the field of arts. For example, you have Arts Westchester, uh, which is is prominent uh, certainly in funding other arts yes, organizations and doing things of struck. its own, uh, yeah. based right here in White Plains, yeah. and uh, uh, they have been instrumental uh, in lobbying in the past uh, when. Uh, through one thing or another, uh, budgets have been cut and the nonprofits uh, but come. We should under keep threat. in mind that the nonprofits do the work that a lot of people don't want to do, mm. and it's very important. Now, uh, some information on sales taxes. Um, the county sales taxes, shown here in the Westchester County take for so far this year. Um, are down. They are only proceeding now at about a one and a half percent rate. Since July, they've been going down from their six six percent trend earlier in the year. And You're talking about increase over yes, last that's year. Right. And so the rate of growth has has uh, taken somewhat of which a, is a winning winnowing down the surplus that they. And well, you know, George, I mean, George Latimer. He's been going around. He's been explaining uh, his budget uh, and and. You know, they uh, are uh, admitting that, that things are tight. Uh, well, they're getting tighter, and they need about 33 million more mm -hmm. than they got last year in November and December to make that $578 million handle that they said they were going to get at the end, beginning of November. You know, like plain sales yeah. tax, good news, they're up 8% in October. Well, that, yeah. that, that's beneficial, isn't it? Now we'll have yes. to see what happens during this Christmas shopping season. Go on out and, and buy Hanukkah some cars, shopping folks. Season, come to I, think of it. Right. Um, most people paid no attention to budgets uh, this week. In fact, a lot of mm -hmm. the focus in the nation certainly was mm -hmm. on the television set. Um, and you may have been among them who saw coverage of President uh, George H.W. Bush lying in state in the Capitol Rotunda mm -hmm. after uh, his demise, uh, or uh, Bush's state funeral, or the burial yesterday at the Bush Library in College Station, Texas. But here's something which you probably did not see. Now, this was sent to us by the U.S. Navy, and what it is is a summary of President Bush's distinguished naval career. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor is attacked without warning, and upon hearing the news, George Bush, a student at the time, decides to join the Navy. One year later, he begins flight training and is then assigned to the USS San Jacinto, making him the youngest naval aviator at the time. They depart from New Jersey, and after some shakedown and a few anti-submarine patrols, Bush finds himself in danger for the first time at the Battle of the Philippine Sea. 
Tied to the deck and ready for launch, the ship comes under fire. Unable to launch until the attack is over, Bush and his crew members brace for impact, hoping that a stray bullet doesn't strike one of the bombs loaded on the plane. Narrowly avoiding disaster, they immediately launch. Shortly after takeoff, there is a drop in oil pressure caused by the attack, and they are forced to make a water landing. USS San Jacinto continues to fight in Rota, Guam, and Patalu. Bush and another pilot receive credit for sinking a small cargo ship, and on August 1st, he is promoted to the rank of Lieutenant Junior Grade. They then head for the Bonin Islands, and on the morning of September 2nd, Bush starts his attack run that would earn him the Distinguished Flying Cross. He quickly encounters heavy anti-aircraft fire and his plane sustains a hit, causing the engine to catch fire. Continuing the attack, he drops four bombs which causes damaging hits. Unable to see and afraid the plane might explode, he flies a few miles away and makes a quick right turn giving him and his crew a chance to bail out, but only his chute opens. He lands in the Pacific, saying, I didn't know what was going to happen for a couple of hours, and then out of the sea came a periscope, and then a submarine. Thank God it turned out to be ours. Over the next 30 days, he experiences the Navy from the tight quarters of the silent service. Serving as a lookout, he shares the joys of rescuing other aviators and the helplessness of being depth charged. After Bush is dropped off in Hawaii, he finds his way back to his unit and rejoins the fight. By December of 1944, his unit is recalled and Bush heads to Norfolk. In his career, Bush flies 58 combat missions, receives the Distinguished Flying Cross and three Air Medals. He is credited with 126 carrier landings and 1,228 flight hours. And you know, uh, looking at that uh, video, it seems especially appropriate today being December 7th, um, the 77th anniversary of the attack on Pearl, Pearl Harbor. Harbor. Yes. Oh my. Yes. Where do we go something, now? It's something to really think about because Pearl Harbor often is not uh, really too much in the news. The greatest generation is disappearing on us. Yes, it has. Now, let's see. What we, what we need to think about is that the celestial realm is very interesting. There was a tremendous event today, and that is that Venus is now close to the Earth, and this is what it looked like on uh, December the 4th. That is Venus in the upper right, and that is the crescent moon. And that is That's known a as great the evening picture. star. Yeah. It, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, and this was, you can still see Venus in the dawn, mm. just before dawn this week. So I was very impressed with that. Just and a couple of quick Trump things uh, yes. this week. Not a, not a whole big report, but it appears that Trump has decided to name State Department spokeswoman Heather Nauert as the ambassador to the United Nations, uh, replacing Nikki Haley, who has resigned. Um, the uh, Mueller investigation continues. Uh, there have been uh, all sorts of developments on that uh, this week. Uh, you should take a look at the New York Times to catch up on that. Uh, big story uh, in the Washington Post. Trump, the man who has made immigration reform and hatred of illegal immigrants cornerstones of his politics, and routinely for years apparently has been hiring illegal immigrants to work for the Trump properties. Two of them have come forward. They've told their stories. In fact, the New York Times had interviews with two of them who've been working at the Trump place in Bedminster, New Jersey. One of them working in Trump's private house there at his site. Uh, they say that there are plenty of other illegal immigrants on the Trump payroll. They say Trump's people knew about them being illegals before they were hired and even told them where to go to get fake papers so that Trump people could hire them without violating federal oh, law. That's the corporate way. Come in. Right. Um, they're now reporting that White House Chief of Staff John Kelly will be out in the next few days. And now to that piece of tape we promised you. Now listen. There's a side of Al Del Vecchio which the general public really did not get to see, and, and that was him 
in a private setting. We saw him in the public setting all the time. But here was a man who, despite the seriousness with which he addressed the needs of the city, had a wonderful sense of humor. My family got to see that over the years, and I'd like to share this two-minute, 12-second video. This is a piece of home video taken July, on June 11, 1991, at a backyard party in White Plains for Seymour Katz. Seymour, or Sonny as he was known, and Al were very close. For his birthday, Al presented him with a proclamation. Now, Jim, you were there at this, and at the end you will see Mayor Del Vecchio needled by comedian Henny Youngman, who made an appearance at the party because Sonny was one of his biggest fans. Sonny, you listen? Whereas, on June 11, 1921, Seymour... What's his word? Sonny Sonny Katz was born and subsequently raised in Port Chester, New York, a little Jewish boy in an Italian neighborhood who learned Italian as though he had studied at Berlitz. <laughs> and whereas on September 7, 1944, Constant Gerstenfeld took Sonny Katz for better or for worse, she couldn't do any better, but not his cigars, <laughs> which, he had, which, which he had to leave outside in the mailbox. And today they are proud parents of four children, Susan, Michael, Ronald, Deborah, Freddie, John, Jill, oh. and five grandchildren. And whereas Sonny, who began working for the city of, began working? Is working for the city of White Plains in 1967 and became city marshal in 1971 and is affectionately called the Catman. <laughs> and by some of his best friends in Winbrook, and whereas while his job responsibilities are many and varied, few are as important as his delivery of milk and eggs on Friday and hot bagels on Sunday. Now therefore, I, Alfred Del Vecchio, mayor of the city of White Plains, do hereby proclaim June 11th 1991 to be Seymour Sunny Cat's Day in White Plains and congratulate him on his 70th birthday and wish him many, 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 many more happy, healthy, chocolate-eating years. <laughs> Just like I taught you. I have the news. We just got the news, Mayor. A bomb fell on Italy. It slid off. A rare look at, at a side of Al Del Vecchio that few people uh, outside of his family and close friends got to see. Wonderful I, sense I, of humor. That proclamation, was. you know, was his work. So. <laughs> Very, uh, he, he, he was a great writer too. That was a good piece. So the uh, the funeral is Monday, ten o'clock at uh, Our Lady of Sorrows. Uh, wake Sunday at uh, McMahon's on Maranek Avenue. Right. John Bailey, Jim Benaroff, Peter Katz. Good night for White Plains Week. This has been White Plains Week news and commentary about White Plains, Westchester, and the world. The views and opinions expressed on this program were solely those of the participants. White Plains Week, produced by White Plains Citizen Net Reporter and presented on Optimum Cable Channel 76 and Verizon Fios Channel 45. You may view White Plains Week anytime on the internet at whiteplainsweek.com, youtube.com, and wpcommunitymedia.org. For White Plains Week, this is Peter Katz speaking.